Good morning. Uh, the subcommittee will come to order. I uh, want to welcome uh, you to our hearing on fiscal year 2018 priorities for nuclear forces and atomic energy defense activities. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today and for your service to our nation. Uh, in uniform or out, uh, your service to the American people is greatly appreciated. Uh, we have a full witness panel today because uh, due to the compressed schedule for uh, the budget request and defense authorization bill, we're going to attempt to cover uh, the waterfront on all things nuclear. Uh, we have the Honorable Frank Klotz, Administrator of the Undersecretary, Undersecretary for Nuclear Security, uh, Dr. Robert Sufer, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy, uh, General Robin Rand, Commander, Air Force Global Strike Command, Vice Admiral Terry Benedict, Director, Navy Strat Strategic Systems Programs, and I know I'm going to butcher this one up, but Dr. John Zangardi, is that all right? All right. Acting Chief Information Officer at the Department of Defense, and Ms. Susan Cange, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Acting Assistant Secretary of Energy for Environmental Management. Uh, two and a half months ago, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Selva, testified before our full committee that, quote, there is no higher priority for the Joint Force than fielding all the components of an effective nuclear deterrent, and we are emphasizing the nuclear mission over all other modernization programs uh, when faced with that choice. We in the Joint Force put our nuclear deterrent as the number one priority for modernization and recapitalization, close quote. Uh, this priority has now been clearly stated by three successive Secretaries of Defense, Secretary Hagel, Secretary Carter, and Secretary Mattis. As my friend and ranking member has repeatedly pointed out, this subcommittee agrees with that prioritization on a bipartisan basis. And I'm pleased to say that the fiscal year 2018 budget a request put forward by the Trump administration, administration two days ago reinforces that priority. This is good news. As a nation, we need to put our money where our mouths are. This committee played a key role in building the current broad bipartisan agreement on the importance of the U.S. nuclear deterrent and the urgent need to carry out the full nuclear modernization programs put forth by the Obama administration. Reflecting on the budget request, let's be clear about one thing. The billion dollar increase uh, for NNSA's nuclear weapons activities goes a long way, but does not fully fill the gap identified by Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz in his letter to the OMB director in 2015. The Secretary said there was over a billion dollar gap between the program of record in FY18 and the funding allo allocated. We're still several hundred million dollars short here. As the Trump administration embarks on its nuclear posture review, in which several of our witnesses are intimately involved, uh, we will take stock today of all the priorities, policies, and programs related to the nuclear deterrence and nuclear security more broadly. Uh, let me briefly highlight two. A particular concern uh, to this subcommittee are the nuclear advances made by foreign countries and how those impact our own deterrent. As we heard from the Defense Science Board earlier this year, quote, nuclear weapons are steadily evolving threat in both new and familiar directions, close quote. <laughs> We must understand how the threat is evolving and anticipate what must be done to compensate. The U.S. focus in recent years has been on downplaying the utility of nuclear weapons, but most other nuclear powers have not downplayed that threat. The U.S. Uh, will ensure its nuclear deterrent is robust and credible against all potential threats today and for the long term. Another longstanding concern of this subcommittee has been the state of the infrastructure within the NNSA enterprise. This committee has had several hearings on the topic in the past year, and I'm pleased that the budget request provides significantly additional funding here. We uh, will take a look at the projects that are being proposed and make sure they are truly buying down the massive backlog of deferred maintenance and repair needs. We will also look to see what authorities and processes can be provided or streamlined to ensure we're doing this smartly, effectively, and efficiently. In closing, let me revisit something that uh, General Hyatt, commander of U.S. Strategic Command, said at our hearing back in March. Quote, at a time when others continue to modernize and expand strategic capabilities, nearly all elements of the nuclear enterprise or nuclear delivery systems, weapons, stockpile, NC3, and other critical infrastru infrastructure are operating well beyond their expected service life. Planned sustainment and modernization activities must be completed on schedule as a delay will impact the execution of our strategic deterrent mission and unacceptably degrade our ability and ultimately our credibility to deter and assure." Close quote. For our number one priority defense mission, this is a sobering reminder of the tremendously important job facing the, these witnesses and this subcommittee. So let's get to work. 
I want to thank our witnesses for being here and uh, look forward to our discussions. With that, let me turn to my friend and ranking member from Tennessee, Mr. Jim Cooper, for any opening statement he may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to welcome the witnesses. And in order to save time, I would ask unanimous consent that my opening statement be made part of the record. Thank you. It's one of the many reasons I like him. He's short and to the point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, uh, we're going to be called for votes in about an hour, so if the witnesses could um, the, your full open statement will be submitted for the record. If you can, can summarize in about three minutes, uh, then we'll get to questions uh, more rapidly. Uh, General Klotz, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will summarize, uh, hopefully, at three minutes. Uh, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cooper, and other members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to present the President's fiscal year 2018 budget request for the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, we value this committee's strong support for the three pillars of NNSA's mission, the nuclear weapons stockpile, nuclear threat reduction, and naval reactors. Our budget request, which comprises approximately half of the DOE budget, is $13.9 billion. This represents an increase, as you pointed out, of uh, over uh, nearly uh, $1 billion, or 7.8 percent, over the fiscal year 2017 omnibus level. This budget request is vital to ensuring that the U.S. nuclear force remains modern, robust, flexible, resilient, ready, and appropriately tailored to 21st century threats and, uh, and to reassure our allies. It also uh, is indicative of the strong support of the administration for the mission and the people of the National Nuclear Security Administration. NNSA's FY 2018 budget request for the weapons activity appropriation is $10.2 billion, an increase of nearly $1 billion, or 10.8 percent, over the fiscal year 2017 omnibus level. This increase is needed to both meet our current life extension program commitments and to modernize our research and production infrastructure so we are positioned to address future requirements and future challenges. The 2018 budget request also includes $1.8 billion for the Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation Account, which is consistent with the funding level in the FY 2017 omnibus. This appropriation continues NNSA's critical and far-reaching mission to prevent, counter, and to respond to nuclear threats. The request for our third appropriations, the Naval Reactors Program, is one point, uh, nearly $1.5 billion. This represents an uh, increase of $60 million, or 4.2 percent, above the FY17 uh, omnibus level. Not only does the requested funding support today's operational fleet, it enables naval reactors to deliver tomorrow's fleet. Our budget request for the fourth and final appropriations account, federal salaries and expenses, uh, is uh, four, uh, 418 million, an increase of 31 million, or 8.1 percent, over the FY17 omnibus level. The request supports recruiting, training, and retaining the highly skilled federal workforce essential to achieving success in technically complex 21st century uh, national security missions. In closing, our FY18 budget request reflects NNSA's motto, mission first, people always. It accounts for the significant tempo of operations at NNSA, which in many ways has reached a level unseen since the Cold War. It includes long overdue investments to repair and replace infrastructure at our national laboratories and production plants, and it provides modern and more efficient workspace for our highly talented scientific, engineering, and professional workforce. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, sir, and I look forward to answering any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you, General. Dr. Suver, you're recognized for the first of many occasions before this committee, I'm sure. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, uh, Ranking Member Cooper, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the President's fiscal year 2018 budget request for nuclear forces. The President directed the Department of Defense to conduct a comprehensive nuclear posture review, and we expect to complete it by the end of this calendar year. I will not prejudge the outcome of the NPR, but will outline some of the challenges and questions that we face. For decades, U.S. nuclear forces have provided the ultimate deterrent against nuclear attacks on the United States and our allies. Nuclear weapons remain a foundational element of U.S. strategy for deterring strategic attacks and large-scale war and for assuring U.S. allies. Effective deterrence requires a deliberate strategy and forces that are structured and postured to support that strategy within the existing security environment. Strategy forces and posture must also be flexible enough to maintain stability 
while adjusting to both gradual and rapid technological and geopolitical changes. Recent years have uh, indeed brought changes that U.S. policy must address. Russia has undertaken aggressive actions against its neighbors and threatened the United States and its allies. It has elevated strategies for nuclear first use, is violating the landmark Intermediate Range uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty, and is modernizing a large and diverse non-strategic nuclear weapons force. In the Asia Pacific, China's increased assertiveness suggests a desire to dominate that region. North Korea's leadership has demonstrated a willingness to accept economic countermeasures and international isolation in order to advance its nuclear capability and develop ballistic missiles able to strike the United States homeland as well as our allies in the region. The United States remains committed to ensuring that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon as the administration conducts its policy review of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, we will continue to meet our commitments under the deal. Iran continues its ballistic missile program, which is outside of the JICPOA. It's against this backdrop that the President directed DOD to ensure that the U.S. nuclear deterrent is modern, robust, flexible, resilient, ready, and appropriately tailored to deter 21st century threats. Each of these characteristics contributes to the effectiveness of our deterrent strategy. As we conduct the NPR, Secretary Mattis has directed that we continue with the existing program of record for recapitalizing our aging nuclear forces. After decades of deferred modernization, replacement programs must proceed without further delay if we are to retain existing deterrent capabilities. DOD expects nuclear recapitalization costs to, uh, to total approximately 230 to $290 billion over more than two decades. This includes the total cost of strategic delivery systems that have a nuclear-only mission and a portion of the B-21 bomber, which will have both conventional and nuclear roles. It also includes modernizing nuclear command and control uh, uh, and communication systems. During this coming period of increased spending for replacement programs, nuclear forces will remain a small fraction of the DOD budget with annual funding levels, including sustainment and operations, projected to range from approximately 3% to 6% of total defense spending. The President's budget request for uh, FY 2018 fully funds DOD nuclear recapitalization programs and provides for nuclear force sustainment and operations. It also adds more than $3 billion across the future year's defense plan relative to the previous year's request to continue improving the health of the DOD nuclear enterprise. These investments demonstrate the President's commitment to nuclear deterrence and national defense. The critical mission of ensuring an effective nuclear deterrent is the highest priority mission of the Department of Defense and one it shares with the Department of Energy and the Congress. And we look forward to continuing to work together in faithfully and responsibly fulfilling this mission. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Suver. General Rand, you're recognized. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cooper, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to appear before you today to represent the men and women of Air Force Global Strike Command. I've testified multiple times for the subcommittee, and I'm looking forward to speaking about the progress and the changes that have taken place in our command since our last meeting in July of 2016. I'm happy to provide my inputs and answer any questions on the ground-based strategic deterrent, long-range standoff weapon, and the B-21 Raider infrastructure requirements, nuclear command control and communication systems, and other programs within Air Force Global Strike. Physical constraints while posing planning challenges do not alter the national security landscape or the intent of competitors and adversaries, nor do they diminish the enduring value of long-range strategic forces to our nation. Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members, I want to thank you for your dedication to our great nation and the opportunity to be, appear before the committee to highlight the need for modernization and efforts across Air Force Global Strike Command. I look forward to your questions. That was a record, like one minute, awesome. Admiral Benedict, you're recognized. Thank you, sir. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cooper, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today representing the men and women of our Navy Strategic Systems Programs. I would like to briefly address the long-term sustainment of the sea-based leg of the triad. While our current life extension efforts will sustain the D-5 system until the 2040s, the Navy is already beginning to evaluate options to maintain a credible and effective strategic weapon system to the end of the Columbia-class service life in the 2080s. 
At SSP, we are looking long-term and across the spectrum from our workforce and infrastructure to our industry partners and geographic footprint. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today about the sea base leg of the triad. I'm pleased to answer your questions at this time. It beat you by 10 seconds, General, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, <laughs> they won't beat Cooper. Dr. Zangardi, you're recognized. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today on the Department's Nuclear Command, Control, and Communication Systems and the risks, challenges, and opportunities within the system and related programs, policies, and priorities for modernization and recapitalization of the NC3 system. I am the Acting Department Chief Information Officer, and I am the Senior Civilian Advisor to the Secretary of Defense for Information Technology and the Information Enterprise that supports the DOD Command and Control, which includes the responsibility for policy, oversight, guidance, and coordination for the Department's NC3 system. My written statement provides more detailed information on these matters, but I want to highlight to you some of the Department's activities in this critical, important mission area. My office's fiscal year 2018 capabilities planning guidance states that we need to strengthen our national leadership command capabilities to meet cha changing threats and to help the president and national leadership ability to command U.S. forces. I believe this budget will help both these areas as we identify threats and ways to mitigate them, which in turn helps our nation's leaders maintain positive control of the U.S. nuclear armed forces. Specifically, the Council on the Oversight of the National Leadership Command and Control communication systems has proved to be a crucial element of the department's strategy. We have been heavily focused on NC3 modernization and sustainment programs. We continue that focus, but will operationalize the discussion based upon what our main customers, the U.S. STRATCOM, Joint Staff, the U.S. NORTHCOM, and the White House require to accomplish their mission over the short and long term. Our objective is to ensure with high confidence that the systems provide the operational capability in time of crisis. Finally, communications is always the key. And I believe the two-way communication between your professional staffers and our DOD teams have increased the cap capability and readiness of our NLCC enterprise. This communications flow has provided clarity to the NC3 mission area. Its acquisition process provided stability for NC3 program offices and ensured warfighter capabilities. We are not done. We have more work to do, and the department is actively pursuing modernization while operating within the confines of a constrained budget environment. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Kane, you're recognized. Good morning, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cooper, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to represent the Department of Energy's Office of Environmental Management and to discuss the important work we have recently accomplished, as well as what we plan to achieve under the President's fiscal year 2018 budget request. The total budget request for the EM program is $6.5 billion, and of that, $5.5 billion is for defense environmental cleanup activities. Before discussing this request, I'd like to take a brief moment to update you on a recent incident at the Hanford site. As you know, there recently was a partial collapse of one tunnel near the Purex facility that has been used since the 1950s to store contaminated equipment. Based on extensive monitoring, there was no release of radiological contamination from the incident and no workers were injured. Workers have filled in the collapsed section with soil and placed a cover over the tunnel. We are working closely with the state of Washington for a more permanent solution. We take this event very seriously and are looking closely at lessons learned. Maintaining and improving aging infrastructure is a priority for EM, and this incident emphasizes the need to continue to focus on these efforts. With regard to recent accomplishments, we continue to demonstrate our ability to make significant progress through achievements like resuming shipments of transuranic waste to the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP. Our fiscal year 2018 budget request will enable us to build on this momentum. The request allows EM to continue to make progress in addressing radioactive tank waste, as well as continuing other important work such as deactivation and decommissioning, soil and groundwater cleanup, and management and disposition of special nuclear materials, spent nuclear fuel, and transuranic and solid waste. 
Our request also includes funding to support the National Nuclear Security Administration by tackling some of their high priority excess contaminated facilities in Oak Ridge and at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. In particular, the 18 request supports continued waste emplacement at WIP. At the Savannah River site, the request supports continuing the tank waste mission through commissioning and startup of the salt waste processing facility. And at Hanford, the budget request supports continued site remediation along the river corridor, and it supports beginning to treat low activity tank waste by 2023. In closing, I'm honored to be here today representing the Office of Environmental Management. We're committed to achieving our mission safely and successfully. Thank you, and I'm pleased to answer any questions. Thank all the witnesses, and I'll recognize myself first for questions. Uh, General Klotz, uh, you talked about the, the $1 billion increase that's in uh, your budget, and uh, uh, while it looks like a lot, it is a lot. Uh, there's a lot of deferred maintenance in NSA, and uh, this is something that the Obama administration recognized uh, early, and uh, without objection, I'd like to introduce a, a letter to that effect uh, from Secretary Moniz from December 15 that clearly states an extra billion dollars a year is needed starting in FY18. In that letter, Secretary Moniz says, quote, we estimate that an additional $5.2 billion over the FY18 through 21 is needed. Failure to address these requirements in the near term will put the NNSA budget in an untenable position beginning in FY18 and will provide misleading marker to the next administration as to the resources needs, resource needs of the nuclear security enterprise, close quote. General Klotz, uh, is this billion dollar in increase for NNSA's weapon activities um, just filling a gap or is it essential part of a long-term uh, recovery from your cir current circumstance. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, question, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the, all the support that this committee has provided to dealing with the infrastructure issues that we have within uh, InterNSA. And I also appreciate the broad bipartisan support uh, for that effort that you uh, outlined in your opening statement. Uh, we're very grateful uh, for the, uh, the level of spending that has been proposed in the President's FY18 uh, budget. It will allow us to attack, uh, tackle some of our very important uh, infrastructure recapitalization projects, such as the uranium process, uh, processing facility at Y-12 in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, which we expect to complete uh, design this year and actually start construction uh, next year. But uh, we didn't get into the situation we face with aging and, in some cases, crumbling infrastructure overnight, and we're not going to get out of it uh, in a day. Uh, this. Uh, uh, so expect us to come forward uh, next year and in subsequent years uh, with requests to begin funding some other very important uh, uh, recapitalization efforts uh, in the area of uh, restoring our ability to produce plutonium pits, in restoring our ability to uh, process the lithium which we need for our uh, nuclear weapons program, and uh, uh, investments to uh, replace our ability to uh, fabricate trusted microsystems that we need to ensure that we have the radiation hard hardened electronics for our, our nuclear uh, forces. Uh, it's fair to say, and my question is, is it fair to say that this is the first year of five years funding uh, that was a program of record by the Obama administration as being essential uh, that was presented to this Congress? Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that the new administration came in and took a uh, looked at uh, our requirements and our needs with a fresh set of eyes, uh, and that they agree uh, that uh, this uh, is a uh, that uh, uh, ensuring that we can complete our life extension programs in order to deliver systems to the uh, Air Force and, uh, and the Navy uh, on time, on schedule, and uh, on budget is essential, and also fixing our infrastructure so that we are flexible. Uh, and responsive uh, to the needs of our nuclear deterrent, uh, both now and well into the future. Okay. General Rand, uh, the GBSD and LRSO uh, DMRR contracts are supposed to be uh, hitting their targets in August or, or uh, September of this year. Is that accurate? Yes, sir, that is accurate. <clears throat> uh, you, so you don't see a problem with that slipping? No, sir, and I have no indication that it will be delayed. Okay. Do you uh, believe, there are many critics that believe the LRSO is, is uh, destabilizing. Is that your opinion? No, sir. Can you tell us why? Well, we've had a nuclear cruise missile since the 1960s. 
Uh, this is not a new capability. It's an improved capability over the outcome that we currently have, the air-launched cruise missile. <clears throat> and when you're in bombers and you take off, first of all, there's a visible presence. Um, and as we fly today, the enemy uh, potential adversaries don't know if we're conventional or nuclear. Uh, and I don't view that as destabilizing at all. Great. Uh, with that, I will yield to the ranking member for any questions he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are many good parts and many bad parts to the recent budget that was submitted to Congress. I thought one of the good parts was the termination of the MOX facility in South Carolina. General Klotz, would you like to reflect on that? Um, thank you, uh, Representative Cooper. Uh, as I indicated, the new administration came in and looked at a lot of uh, programs uh, that are within uh, the uh, scope of the Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Security Administration uh, and came to the conclusion uh, that the MOX fuel fabrication uh, project uh, uh, in uh, Savannah River, South Carolina, ought to be terminated. Uh, the conclusion was based on uh, the fact that this is an extraordinarily expensive program, $5 billion have already been invested in it. Uh, we estimate it would take an additional $12 billion to go just to complete the uh, project, uh, and that doesn't even begin to address the costs of, uh, long-term cost of operating the program. Uh, we have developed an alternative strategy uh, for uh, disposing of excess uh, weapons-grade plutonium. It's called the dilute and dispose approach, which we briefed to this committee last year. Uh, it is a proven technology. We have already in place uh, 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 diluted uh, uh, plutonium at the waste isolation pilot project, the WIP uh, facility in New Mexico. Uh, it is not, we know what the, uh, it's a proven technology, the risks are lower, the costs are lower, and it gets plutonium out of the state of South Carolina far faster uh, than the MOX project would. Thank you, General. I hope my uh, colleagues pay attention to the General's comments because this is an annual issue in the defense authorization bill. So I hope that we can come to a sensible resolution. This issue has hung fire for many, many years now. Um, Ms. Kange, regarding Hanford and the tunnel collapse, it's my impression that in the Trump budget we're reducing the appropriation or the authorization for Hanford by over $100 million. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. The FY18 budget request for the uh, Richland Operations Office uh, is reduced um, from what the 17 omnibus so you would mentioned we're going to be cooperating with the state of Washington on fixing that tunnel problem other than just putting dirt on it. Yes. Uh, so what's likely to be the resolution? There's a number of alternatives that have been developed and are currently being evaluated. They range from potentially filling the tunnel with a fillable grout material to stabilize the tunnel and the contamination until such a time that a permanent remedy will be implemented to, at the upper end, uh, uh, constructing a structure over the tunnel. So the various alternatives are still under evaluation. So we're really not talking about a fix. We're talking about covering up the problem or stabilizing it. We're, we're talking about ensuring that we stabilize the tunnel and the material that is contained within the tunnel in a way that this type of incident will not occur again until a final remedy is reached between the tri-party uh, parties. But no one will be able to use the tunnel in the meantime? Uh, the tunnel has not been used since the early 1950s. Okay. Um, Dr. Zingardi, um, many of the NC3 programs are delayed or over cost. In fact, when you look at the long list of those that are delayed and or over cost, it's almost hard to find one that is working on time uh, as expected. What are we going to do to improve the performance record here? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Uh, regarding NC3 programs, uh, breaking the Could you answer pull the microphone closer? Breaking the answer down into two parts. First, I, I run the national, the NLCC, and as part of the NLCC, we have taken a review of these programs and understand your concerns and recognize the delays to the program. 
Uh, the Air Force has been tasked by the chairs of the NLCC, uh, AT&L is one of the chairs, along with the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to review these programs, look for areas of causality, is there a common cause or root cause between all these problems, and develop solutions to get the programs back on track. The Department is very focused on correcting these issues. Additionally, uh, we were in Omaha where we had a group meeting of about 30 seniors to look at the NC3 enterprise several weeks ago. Tasks came out of that to begin looking at things we can do to improve the overall operational resilience of the systems that are currently out there. So we're looking at it in two ways. One, with the NLCC, figuring out how we can improve the program's performance as they come on in the future. And two, dealing with the systems that are out there that we must currently maintain. So is your answer consistent with the number one priority that the nuclear mission has within the Department of Defense? Yes, sir, it is. We have stated very clearly in meetings with uh, my leadership that this is the highest priority. Uh, we have stated that very clearly in the NLCC council meetings, and it was very clear when we met at Omaha that this is the highest priority. I'm in lockstep agreement with uh, General Heighton on these issues, sir. So we are going to be performing better in the future, and I can hold you to that. Our objective is to perform better in the future, sir, and I'll be glad to come back and answer any questions in the future if problems arise or to talk to you about performance. Well, I think that sounds a little bit like accountability, but I'm not sure that that's full accountability, the willingness to answer questions. Presumably, you'd be willing to answer questions anyway. Yes, sir. It is accountable. I am working these areas. I report directly to the DSD on these areas and keep him apprised of it. Uh, the accountability is very clear as it's defined in recent legislation in the NDAA about DOD CIO having responsibilities in the NLCC area. So as you well know, without command and control, the weapon systems are largely useless. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions until the... Uh, Thank the gentleman. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from the great state of Alabama, Mr. Byrne. For Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral Benedict, uh, I'm concerned about the tight time frame for the Columbia class, and I know you are too. Um, and, and looking at it, I know that uh, there's not too much wiggle room there. So I'd like to ask you this question. If the Columbia class program is delayed or slips by just one year, will there be a gap in the sea base leg of the triad? Yes, sir. Uh, today, the current program has basically one Columbia class entering service as one Ohio replacement platform depart service. So if there was a slip, although we believe firmly that we can execute the program of record, there would be a gap. Yes, sir. Now, and I appreciate your saying it as clearly as you did, because we need to hear that as we go forward into budgets, not just this year, but as you know, in the entire cycle that we've got here, we just don't have any room for not hitting the mark each year. Is that a fair statement? That, that is a fair statement. Uh, we've already taken a two-year slip in the Columbia class, which pushed us basically line on line with the Ohio's retirement. Yes, sir, that, that gap has been uh, eroded. Admiral, thank you for your candor. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair, I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for, for being here as well. Um, we're aware that in this budget there's a 5% decrease for defense nuclear nonproliferation. And I'm just wondering how we justify that. I know you mentioned it was consistent, I believe, with the omnibus, uh, 17 omnibus, but uh, at the same time we're requesting increasingly large sums of money for our own nuclear arsenal. Is there a disconnect here, and how do you translate this to the general public? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. Um, my explanation will be uh, a little lengthy, perhaps, because I think the misunderstanding has to do with how the budget uh, appropriations accounts are laid out uh, in the budget. Uh, under uh, the a line that we call defense nuclear nonproliferation, I, I would bend them in, in three different ways. First of all, there are those things that we do in the traditional nonproliferation uh, mission space. 
then there are uh, dollars that we pay for our ability to uh, uh, counter nuclear terrorism and respond to, uh, a, God forbid, a radiological or nu nuclear incident anywhere in the United States or abroad. And then there is also the, uh, the uh, construction project under the Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation Account, uh, which includes the MOX fuel fabrication facility that Representative Cooper just asked about. So the bulk of the reduction in that uh, appropriations account uh, reflects uh, the uh, administration's proposal that we terminate uh, the MOX project. So the total amount of money going to MOX goes uh, from the, uh, the FY17 omnibus level of about 345, I believe, uh, down to uh, 279. So that accounts for a lot of it. Uh, in the area, and we've also seen an increase in our ability to uh, the spending that we want to have for nuclear counterterrorism and incident response in order to recapitalize all the equipment, the, the radiation detectors, the secure uh, wireless telephones that uh, our people would use with other domestic partners in responding to it. In the pure defense nuclear nonproliferation area, uh, the funding is relatively flat. It would have been exactly flat. Uh, if um, the uh, Congress had appropriated uh, what we requested in FY17, but you plussed us up a little bit uh, at uh, a week or two before the budget went to, uh, went to press, and so there was just a very, very slight uh, decrease uh, in the overall uh, mm -hmm. spending for, that we're proposing for defense nuclear nonproliferation. Okay. It's, still a, it's still a very robust program. $1.8 billion is a very robust program in this area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And, and I think, Dr. Sufer, to you as well, I mean, uh, would you agree that the nuclear deterrent is our number one priority? Yes, ma'am, I would. Uh, the, the, the deterring uh, nuclear attack and assuring our, our allies has been a fundamental and enduring goal of the United States government during the Cold War and over the last three nuclear posture reviews. Would, um, would it be a better, I guess, example or demonstration of that uh, if we did, as the NSA did, uh, a long-term plan for nuclear weapons modernization. It's my understanding that uh, the Department of Defense doesn't really submit a 25-year plan for, um, for its nuclear weapons plan. Is that accurate, and how, how do we, again, connect that? Well, we currently have plans to modernize each leg of the nuclear triad, as well as the nuclear command and control system, and uh, that modernization will take us out until about 2040. We provide Congress uh, an annual report on, on funding over the next 10 years, the Section 1043 report. Um, but you're, you're correct, uh, Congresswoman, we don't do a 25 or 30 year plan, but we, we have forces planned that will last over those years. Mm -hmm. I think my time is up, but um, perhaps there's a way to better frame that um, so that there's a sense of more consistency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Sufer, uh, and thank you all for being here and your service. Uh, Dr. Sufer, if we studied the technical feasibility of, of uh, mobile capable ICBMs, along with the advantages and disadvantages of those possible weapons, would we learn useful information? I'll ask uh, General Rand to comment on that, but I can assure you that uh, as we conduct a nuclear posture review, uh, everything is on the table, and that is something that we will, we will have to look at. Sir, we have, uh, we have looked at that with the GBSD, and it is our best judgment that we do not go to mobile. I can talk more in the closed session on reasons why. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm going to ask General Klotz and Dr. Sufer another question. I'm not a fan of the New START Treaty. Uh, for one thing, it was, it's a relic of the Cold War. It, it did not address emerging powers like China, just ourselves and the former Soviet Union. And when it was passed, we now know the Russians were cheating on the INF Treaty. And whether or not the Obama administration knew this, the senators who voted on it did not know that fact. So uh, I've been distressed because the Obama administration was quick to start the dismantling of our nuclear forces that were called for under the New START Treaty, but slow to do the modernization that was promised as a hedge against losing capability. 
So for either General Klotz or Dr. Sufer, please give an update on what we have left to do, what's remaining to be done to update our nuclear enterprise, which remains un unfinished. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, on the NNSA Department of Energy side, uh, our priorities uh, as far as uh, sustaining and modernizing our nuclear enterprise uh, at the moment are focused on um, four major weapon systems that ride on uh, either the Navy sea launch ballistic missiles or the Air Force uh, two, uh, two legs of the triad. Uh, and uh, so uh, a, a level of effort, as I think I suggested in the opening comments, that we have not seen since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we are also focused on making sure uh, that within the NNSA, within our nuclear enterprise, uh, we have the scientific, technical, and engineering base and the production infrastructure that is necessary to continue to uh, sustain uh, a modern and effective uh, nuclear arsenal, and also to be able to adapt or respond to any unexpected challenges, whether they're technical challenges or whether they're political military challenges. And our budget uh, request for uh, FY18, I think, and, uh, reflects the importance of making and continue to make investments uh, in this area. Okay, let me let me follow up on that, and then we'll get to Dr. Sufer. Uh, even if we do everything in the budget that you recommend, and I, I hope we do, how much of a gap will we still have? Uh, I'm just asking in general terms, not tech, not specific terms, for the for the public at large. I still think, um, as I was responding to uh, uh, Chairman Rogers' uh, remarks, I still think, uh, you know, we have underinvested in the nuclear enterprise since the end of the Cold War. It's almost as if when the Berlin Wall went down uh, and the Soviet Union collapsed, we all heaved a sigh of collective relief and said, thank goodness we don't have to worry about that anymore. And so for the subsequent years, we didn't make the investments we needed. It was not a high priority, uh, either in the services or for that matter uh, uh, in the Department of Energy. Uh, we've been trying to rectify that uh, for a number of years now on both sides of the Potomac. Uh, and, um, but as I indicated, it, it took us a long time to get into this situation. It's going to take us a while to get out of it, but we're working it very, very hard. And with this particular budget, uh, we make a huge down payment uh, in some key critical areas that we need to continue um, uh, sustaining our, our nuclear weapon stockpile and our infrastructure. There will be more to follow as we go through our process of deciding how best to recapitalize that. So I would expect in next year's budget and in subsequent budgets, you'll, you will continue to see us place an emphasis on uh, restoring our, uh, our infrastructure. I know time is li li uh, limited, Dr. Sufer. I'm sorry, uh, sir, uh, your comments about the New START uh, Treaty are well taken. In fact, when, uh, when, the, when the Congress considered the New START Treaty, uh, and, and particularly the Senate, they realized that uh, the disparity in tactical nuclear weapons, right, non-strategic nuclear weapons between Russia and China was something of, of great concern and that that needed to be addressed. And since then, uh, the Russia has actually increased the numbers of its non-strategic nuclear weapons, and the INF Treaty violation uh, is just one example. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, now recognizes Mr. O'Rourke for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Benedict, I'd like to get your, your comments um, and your thoughts on commonality between um, Navy and Air Force. Uh, my, my understanding is that you could have um, similar components for land-based uh, deterrence and sub-launched uh, deterrence. Uh, do, do you feel that you have the, the level of cooperation with the Air Force necessary to do that? And also, could you talk about just what that means in, in numbers in the budget? My understanding is we would, in, in a strategy like this one, likely spend a lot more up front to save a lot more down the road. Uh, what, what are we looking at in, in terms of numbers? And you know, in, any comments or thoughts you'd, you'd like to share with us uh, so that we're aware in the FY18 budget and then also as we look ahead to future budget years, uh, the, the kinds of factors that we need to be looking at to make sure that this is a success. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll provide my answer, and then I'd like to offer, if, you, if it's okay with you, General Rand's comments on, the, on this subject. Um, commonality is, a, is an initiative that um, I've been pushing for a number of years. Um, 
through the concurrence of, at that time, General Admiral Haney out at Stratcom and the two uh, RDAs, uh, for re the two assistants in the Navy and the Air Force, the Navy and the, and the United States Air Force were directed to do a commonality study. Uh, that took about a year. Uh, we looked at a spectrum from totally common missile to piece parts to the programs of record. Uh, obviously, we came through a technical analysis that said total commonality uh, had a number of major technical challenges as well as infrastructure challenges, which made doing that t in today's environment uh, financially and from a schedule standpoint unfeasible. Uh, the concern is the budget, and we all understand the budget to recapitalize. That's been discussed here. So what we came up with uh, at, at a fairly deep technical analysis is opportunities in all the major subsystems. Uh, we worked those together and we pushed that back up through the leadership change. In parallel with that, the United States Air Force uh, was running its preps for the ground-based strategic deterrence program. Um, their acquisition strategy was to turn that over to industry. All that information was passed to industry in a bidder's library. And so the industry uh, partners who bid on the GBSD have the opportunity to draw from that library and submit that as part of their proposals. Uh, those proposals are actually in process of review by the United States Air Force, and General Rand can talk to that. I think once we see the results of that down select uh, as part of the Air Force process, then we are prepared with the Air Force to re-engage and share uh, and continue down the path of commonality. But right now, I, we're, I will say we're paused as the Air Force goes through its acquisition down select, which is appropriate. So, and I'll allow General Rand to, to answer the question as well, but so if I understand, we've, we've decided that total commonality doesn't make sense for the reasons that you gave. There'll be some level of partial commonality. Yes, sir. And uh, what I'd like to know from General Rand and, and from you, Admiral, is, is the, the year in which we can expect the answer to the question that you're trying to to, to get to that's currently paused. So if, if I may, I'll just finish and then turn it over to General Rand. Um, it, in terms of dollar cost savings, sir, I, again, I, I'm going to contend that based on the Air Force decision of down select to two from the three potential bidders today to the final solution, I think we need to get to that final solution working through this down select. Before we'll, able, before we'll be able to provide you a, a definitive dollar savings in the year. But when can I'm we expect to get there? Well, yes, sir. Um, we're right now hopefully going to have a down select the two competitors this summer. That will give us more fidelity. We'll run the TMRR, the technology maturation risk reduction process, for three years with those two competitors, and then we'll further down select to the, the uh, source. Uh, in 2021, so that it'll take a little while to get some of this fidelity, if I may, sir. Um, first of all, I'm the requirements guy. I'm not the acquisition. I don't drive acquisition strategy. We've set the requirements, and we've delivered those requirements as we see for GBSD. However, I do think there's a misconception, as, uh, as Terry was talking about, what commonality is. A D5 is not going to work in the land-based missile. It's not going to fit in our launch facilities. It would take a major over, overhaul to do that. So when you define commonality, the term that we've used is smart commonality. And where can we have synergy together? And we are looking at repair facilities, manufacturing processes, test capabilities. All those could significantly reduce redundant in multiple kind of platforms. And those were the savings will be. So we're very supportive of commonality. Uh, but we believe in open competition, and that's where the acquisition strategy is driving us right now. Thank you very much. Thank yes, you, sir. Mr. Chair. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, for five minutes. We just passed in the House Foreign Affairs Committee um, a resolution dealing with uh, Venezuela and the economic circumstances that they uh, face, and quite frankly, uh, what Venezuela is going through is devastating. 75% um, of their population has experienced a weight loss of at least uh, 19 pounds over the past year because they cannot get enough uh, calories and food to sustain their body weight. 
medicines are now in short supply because the people can't afford them, the government can't afford them. Um, you've got uh, diseases that were once eradicated coming back. And the reason I ask the, or bring up these uh, topics is uh, we've been warned by the Congressional Budget Office and by the Comptroller General of the United States of America and by the Government Accountability Office that America's current financial path is unsustainable, which means that in the future we're risking a similar collapse. And you can imagine the adverse effect that that would have on our military capabilities in particular if we go through the same thing that uh, economic reality dictates is going to happen if we don't change our trajectory. That being the case, and I don't know if any of y'all are in a position to answer this question, but what can you do in the areas that you oversee to increase efficiency so that taxpayers can get more bang for the buck? Or in the alternative, what can you eliminate uh, if the need arises, thereby saving money that might reduce the dangers associated with our deficit? Um, and if, if you can't do anything in the fields that you uh, personally oversee, uh, what do you think we should be doing uh, on, a, on a larger scale to minimize our risk of a debilitating insolvency and bankruptcy that our financial gurus warn us is in our future. Sir, thank you for the question. Um, and I understand your, your point. Um, Trident has been a, a program, Strategic Systems Programs, has been in existence for 61 years. And as we build the new Columbia class, the Navy's number one priority in shipbuilding, uh, that boat will be in the water through 2084. As I've looked at my contribution to that program, uh, the strategic weapon system, uh, we recently, uh, in discussions with Lockheed, endorsed their plan to move uh, our workforce out of an extremely high cost area uh, to two other locations within the United States, which- I when, hope Alabama's on that list. No, sir. You might want to look at the cost yeah, yeah, of doing yes, business sir. in Alabama. <laughs> uh, granted. I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, sir. Um, but once we do this, and it's a very, sh very fast-paced move, uh, we will move to, Col we will move to Colorado and to Florida. Uh, the return savings to the program is, is somewhere in excess of $55 million a year. So we understand our contribution to the strategic deterrent to the triad, to the nation, we also understand our responsibility to do so in the most cost-effective manner possible. So that's, I would say, one of the solution spaces that we constantly review and invoke uh, within the program given the long-term uh, future that we have in support of, of this mission. Vice Admiral Benedict, that is wonderful news. Does anybody else have any suggestions on what we can do to try to uh, protect America's financial status? So in the area that I work, sir, um, in the CIO area, we're, I'm specifically tasked to look at effectiveness and efficiency, and I work very closely with the DCMO for the Department of Defense. And we're looking at competition, more importantly in the uh, IT space, if you will, much of what we procure is commercial off-the-shelf technology. So increased use of commercial off-the-shelf technology where we don't engage in making changes to it. So in imposing and using change management to constrain cost in the procurement of business systems is very important. I know not directly related to this, but the savings you generate from those systems can be used for other purposes. For example, we're looking at the defense travel system right now, and we're looking at moving to commercial applications. I'm currently assessing pilots to put in place about 15 to 30,000 users to see how it goes, and eventually to move to something that is commercial with very little change management. Thank you, Dr. Zen Guardian. We're running out of time. I've got 10 seconds. Um, I would strongly encourage each of you to do whatever you can to try to put more efficiency into the federal acquisition process, particularly the federal acquisition regulatory process. In my experience and observation over the decades, it seems that uh, the procurement process has gotten drawn out more and more at higher and higher cost. And there has to be a way to fix that. Thank you for your time and insight. Thank the gentleman, uh, Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from New, New Jersey, Mr. Norcross, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Klotz, I want to follow up on uh, your comments on Mox. I was down there last year, and some of the numbers that you were quoting are 
direct contradiction to what we saw and what we heard in terms of percentage finished of the plant. Uh, literally a few weeks ago, we allocated $345 million, and you said in year 18 we have $279 million. What's that being used for if you're canceling the project? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. My bad. Um, uh, the actual amount would be for 270 for the MOX uh, fuel fabrication facility itself. There's another $9 million that's associated with other aspects of our plutonium disposition mission. Uh, in any large government contract, uh, particularly one, a large construction effort uh, that has been underway for some years uh, in uh, South Carolina, uh, there are termination costs. There are a series of uh, of steps we have to take dictated by statute and dictated by um, our own regulations to wind down a, a contract. So uh, if the Congress uh, agrees with the administration's proposal to terminate uh, MOX, uh, then we will come back to you with a specific plan as to what we have to do to meet those regulatory requirements and at the same time uh, how we will proceed with uh, the facility uh, is there uh, that uh, that has been uh, constructed thus far so a half a billion dollars for termination fees it's, uh, we, we, I'd be happy to come back to you and lay out uh, what the costs are associated uh, with uh, with with termination so a year ago, they were almost 70% 70, 70 complete. I assume they got further along this year. Well, we don't, um, quite frankly, um, and with respect to those who, who calculate uh, a higher percentage, uh, the standard uh, practice for calculating uh, percent complete, at least within the federal government, is uh, cost already expensed and cost to go. So if you accept our estimates, or I don't have to take my estimates, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the total project cost of $17 billion, we've already spent, as I indicated, $5 billion. Uh, that would leave $12 billion to go. So five divided by 12 is, is less than 50%. Uh, so our assumption uh, of the way in which we calculate um, uh, you know, percent complete is, is different than others have calculated it. Well, certainly then we have to get the bottom of that because we're talking some considerable money as compared to what we just heard about in a few minutes. Uh, I'll yield back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Chairman Wilson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Mike Rogers, for your leadership of the subcommittee with the bipartisan input of Ranking Member Jim Cooper. Again, thank uh, each of you for your service. It's, it's extraordinary on behalf of our nation. And of course, General Klotz, I am uh, keenly interested uh, in the uh, mixed oxide fuel fabrication facility. Uh, last year, Congress thoughtfully, in a bipartisan manner, rejected the prior administrator's, administration's short-sighted proposal to terminate the mixed oxide fuel fabrication facility, the MOX program, which is 70 percent completed in the area of South Carolina and Georgia. The Congress had many concerns with the alternatives, including the legal, regulatory, and political issues with storing the entirety of 34 metric tons. The fact that it does not comply with the Plutonium Management Disp Disposition Agreement, PMDA, with the Russian Federation, and the fact that uh, Congress does still not have a complete valid cost estimate of the MOX program because the Department of Energy never completed a full base rebaseline. Ultimately, the authorizers and appropriators both agreed to continue construction of MOX as the best path forward and included legislative text requiring it in the FY 15, 16, and 17. And a, the question, uh, has an industrial scale dilute and dispose method with weapons grade plutonium ever been done before? Uh, if not, what is the, uh, if not processed, uh, what is the timeline for removal from South Carolina and Georgia? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Wilson. Uh, the, um, in terms of what we know about dilute and dispose, uh, we already have five metric tons of diluted uh, plutonium, uh, largely from the Rocky Flats uh, facility that used to be in Colorado. Uh, in WIP uh, as we speak. Uh, we have also diluted uh, plutonium that existed at South Carolina, that was in South Carolina 
and have shipped that to WIP. In fact, we've done a, uh, three shipments already this year since, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as was alluded to earlier, uh, WIP has reopened for operations. I went down to WIP about uh, a month or so ago and personally uh, toured the site uh, and was briefed on what they uh, believe the capacity of WIP is uh, to hold not only uh, non-weapons uh, uh, grade plutonium but all 34 metric tons. And I came away from that quite convinced uh, that, uh, that 34 metric tons can fit within the, uh, the WIP facility. Uh, so. Um, the other, uh, I think, very, very interesting point uh, about, uh, about uh, this whole process is it allows us to get uh, plutonium out of the state of South Carolina far sooner uh, than would and, be the case. And, and, let, and let's get to that now, the, uh, because uh, WIP uh, is not industrial grade now, uh, and, but you're describing something industrial grade. And uh, what is the timeline, uh, and, and specifically, uh, how many years uh, are you talking about? Because uh, my constituents are very concerned about being uh, a, a dump uh, and a disposal area, uh, which puts uh, our region at risk. Uh, well, I don't understand the, the term industrial um, facility. It's a capability to truly process a large amount. Yeah, well, we have the, we have the ability to, uh, we, what we would have to do is, like I said, we're already processing um, uh, plutonium at a Savannah River. And what, what it would require would yeah, be what, what, adding... Okay, back, back again, because time's running out. What, uh, what is the timeline? Um, my constituents uh, and the people of South Carolina and Georgia would like to know. Um, let, me, uh, let me give you this, uh, the specific timeline. It's not showing up on what I have right here sitting in front of me. Uh, but I will tell you it is far faster than anything can be done with, uh, with MOX. And, and that timeline would be... Because the uh, reprocessing is gone, okay. uh, but what, what you're describing uh, could take years. Okay, uh, here's, uh, here's our, our estimate. Uh, if we went down what we call the surplus plutonium disposition project, uh, we expect that we would complete the work that we need to do that by 2027, and plutonium disposition would begin in 2028 and end in 2049. If we go down the MOX route, uh, we would not complete the project to 2048. Uh, that is uh, my rough calculation, 20 some odd years later. Uh, and uh, we would not begin disposing of plutonium uh, through a MOX facility until the year 2050 to 2051, assuming uh, that we get all the uh, uh, NRC licensing completed. And dis uh, plutonium disposition would not end until 2065, uh, which is again, uh, 15, 20 years after what we would be able to do uh, with uh, the surplus, uh, uh, the, the, the approach we would like. The main difference, however, is the total project cost for MOX, we estimate to be $17 billion. Uh, the total project cost for the surplus uh, 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 disposal that we have suggested, uh, right now we have a range of 200 to 500 million to do that. And, and if the Congress gives us the authority, my, my to time ahead. is up. But uh, indeed, please look at the. Uh, we we want to remove by uh, reprocessing uh, the uh, weapons grade plutonium. What you're describing is uh, I consider long term. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from Hawaii, Ms. Hannah Booster, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Sufer only because of the fact that your testimony referenced it. We are in the process or, of doing the nuclear posture review. You're in the process of doing that. I think it's a review that's usually done for every five to 10 years. I think the last one was in 2010. My question is really one more practicality. We have heard uh, people take positions on the triad and what uh, we should be funding. I think even the Secretary of Defense at one time had uh, taken uh, a position uh, questioning whether or not the triad is the way to go. We have um, someone who we have all listened to in terms of his review of the QDR, and that, of course, is former Secretary of Defense William Perry at Stanford, who has said basically he, he doesn't like the triad system and, and questions the whole use of um, long-range uh, missiles, for example. And he, I think at one point he even questioned whether we should have the 
concentration of um, ICBMs as well. So given that, and given the fact that this review isn't going to be done till the end of the year, and I understand that we should continue along the way, decisions that we are to may be made on major expenditures, uh, such as the, uh, the uh, new bomber, uh, B-21s, uh, and uh, all the different types of what, what is expected uh, to do the, the nuclear defense posture for, for this country. How do you justify that at this particular point in time when we've got people whose opinions some of us value, I think most of us at least will pay attention to, how, how, can, you, how can you come before us and take a position when we know that there is at least enough of a concern that the posture has been required to be reviewed. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I think the, uh, there's a sense, we, f we feel there's a sense of urgency to get on with the program of record because uh, the current systems will age out uh, within the next 10 to 15 years. And if we do not begin or continue the process of uh, acquiring new systems, there will be a gap in deterrence capability. Uh, the, um, the, the, the previous administ administration has, has laid in a, a nuclear modernization program that, uh, again, appears to be consistent with uh, general principles uh, of nuclear deterrence. Uh, we will examine these principles and determine, in light of the new strategic environment, whether they still obtain. But there are some uh, basic fundamentals, such as maintaining a nuclear triad, that the Secretary of Defense has already endorsed. And so, quite frankly, it's just a sense of urgency that if we do not continue the programs this year, there may be a gap if it's ultimately determined that these systems are needed. Well, I understand that the Secretary um may have uh, said he's endorsing it now, but there was a point in time, maybe it was before he became Defense Secretary, that he called into question the premise of uh, the triad as well. And the fact that the, N the NPR has basically now been mandated is problematic. I understand the urgency that we speak about here. I, theoretically, I understand all of that, however, We've never had such an emphasis uh, that I recall where most of the briefings that we've had in a very short period of time has concentrated on our nuclear position. And I understand that's probably triggered by Russia, China, and North Korea. However, the concept of developing a systematic posture and to review that posture seems to be one that we need to be very certain about that threat and how we best address that threat. And that is why for the expenditures that we are being asked to authorize, how do we know that this is the best way for us to proceed? And I'm out of time, so we may have to take if it. If I may, ma'am, I need to comment on one comment you made about the B-21. Uh, we can have the discussion about the nuclear posture and the triad, but the B-21 will be a dual capable airplane. There's a requirement for long-range strike conventionally, and that will be obviously what that airplane would be doing. Any delay to that program would be devastating. General, Our newest bomber is 25 years old. Ge I understand that, General. The question more is a matter of number, whether it's 100 or 200. We've heard two numbers. That's a huge amount of numbers, but shouldn't we know whether we're The requirement we're right now is for 100 B-21s. Mr. Chair, I yield back. I think that votes for you know, time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins, for five minutes. I thank the chair. Uh, this will be a question for uh, Mrs. Cange and <clears throat> General Klotz. During our oversight and investigation subcommittee hearing in March on NNSA's uh, deferred maintenance and infrastructure challenges, we briefly discussed how certain OMB directives have negatively impacted NS, uh, NNSA's ability to get after its decaying infrastructure. In particular, OMB Management Procedures Memorandum 2015-01 uh, was identified as a huge problem because it perhaps unintentionally slows NNSA's ability to tear down old buildings and build new ones. General Klotz, can you give us your personal views on that OMB memorandum and whether it impedes NNSA from making smart decisions and moving efficiently to deal with infrastructure problems? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, I think the intent 
uh, behind the directive, which is as you build new buildings, you ought to dispose of excess facilities, is a good one. Uh, in the, when I was in the Air Force, the rule used to be build a building, tear a building down. Otherwise, you see this behavior where people start to move into those buildings which you've moved out of and you still have a, an infrastructure issue. However, I think uh, the, no the notion that you have to do this simultaneously is more constraining than it needs to be. Uh, I hear anecdotally, I haven't had a chance to get the empirical data on that, that uh, maybe some, uh, some site uh, directors would, uh, would choose to wait uh, to build a new building until they knew they had enough money that they could dispose of an older building. So I would like to see uh, it's good intent, uh, but I would like to see a little more flexibility in terms of uh, how we actually uh, balance uh, new construction with demolition and, and disposition of old uh, buildings. Okay. In general, uh, I understand your budget request will put an additional $195 million above the FY17 appropriated level toward deferred maintenance and repair needs at NNSA, and that uh, you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kange, have a line in your budget for $225 million to deal with four excess facilities at Y12 and Lawrence Livermore. Uh, this is good news, but I need to ask you, uh, General uh, Klotz, could you execute additional money on deferred maintenance and repair needs if it was provided by Congress? The backlog of, um, of deferred maintenance is so large uh, that uh, what we have asked is not going to buy all of it down. Um, so it's a question of, uh, uh, you know, timing in terms of which the money comes. We do have, there are, there are some capacity limits. Uh, in terms of local craft uh, and uh, companies to be able to do that. The other challenge we have in NNSA, and this is where uh, Ms. Kenj can, uh, has to help us out, is many of the facilities we have, particularly facilities in Y-12 and our other laboratories, are contaminated with, uh, you know, either radioactive materials or other, uh, other, other contaminants, and we have to go through the process of decontaminating those facilities first before we can do the standard uh, you know, demolition of that. So there are some significant costs associated with some of our, some of our facilities. Okay. So the 3.7 billion backlog isn't gonna get fixed without additional funding in all likelihood? Well, look, uh, thanks to this committee's strong support, uh, we stabilized um, the um, level of deferred maintenance we had in fiscal year 16. Uh, with 17, we'll see it, uh, we'll see it decrease slightly, modestly, and if uh, the Congress supports the FY18 uh, budget, we'll continue that downward slope. Okay. Uh, I might add that, uh, again, through the support of Congress, one of, the, uh, one of the good news things that came out of the passage of the omnibus, uh, FY17 omnibus bill, is we'll be able to proceed with the demolition of the uh, Bannister Federal Complex in Kansas City, which is a five million square foot facility, World War II facility, of which we used about $3 million. That is now, with the funding provided by the Congress, we will now be able to go ahead and do that and also save the federal government a considerable amount of money in how we do that uh, by allowing a, a private developer to, uh, to do the demolition and the remediation of the property. Okay, Ms. Kange, uh, do you expect to continue into FY19 and beyond the excess facilities line with environmental ma management program? I think it's a great idea and would encourage you to continue it, but is that your intent? Yes, we, we certainly hope to be able to continue to uh, address excess contaminated facilities across the DOE complex. I will mention that uh, the 2016 report to Congress that the department submitted on excess contaminated facilities uh, estimates uh, approximately $32 billion to address all of the excess facilities across the department's entire complex. All right, thank you, and I yield back. Okay, we have about nine minutes left to vote, so I wanna go ahead and try to get the Mr. Garamendi in before we head over uh, to the chamber, and then we'll come back after votes for the closed session. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, this is all of this is extremely important. I want to go to uh, follow up on Mr. Rourke's questions about uh, commonality, and specifically, uh, Admiral Benedict. Uh, you have a couple of new bombs that are being reworked: the W88 and the W76. Uh, are those, my understanding is they're supposed to last some 20 years or more into the future, is that correct? Sir, our planning factors um, are 
uh, it, the life extension programs are a 30-year extension to the existing life of the weapon itself. Okay, so some 30 years. Um, do you need the interoperable weapon? Sir, uh, at the direction of the Nuclear Weapons Council, uh, the Navy, the Air Force, and NNSA uh, were directed to conduct uh, a study. That study uh, was scheduled to commence in 2020, and we will do both the technical analysis of the IW as well as the cost analysis. That information will be presented approximately late 21, 22 to the Nuclear Weapons Council for review concurrence and approval if they so deem so. I'm sorry, 8 21, 22, what is that? I'm 2021, 20, 20, 2021, so for 2022. The next three years, we'll continue to spend money on the interoperable. We'll, 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 we will spend money to do the technical analysis between the services and NNSA. I, excuse me. I, I, yes, sir. Back and forth here, and I hope in a way that is not uh, so if you have a two weapons yes, sir. that currently work on the missiles and your missiles are good for 30 years and your weapons are good for 30 years, do you ever need an interoperable for at least 30 years? Sir, I, I, I would say, and then I'll, I'll defer to uh, the General Klotz here for one second. The Navy does not have a requirement for a third reentry body. However, as we look at the complex in total, this, this issue of IW is larger than just a single Navy issue. It involves Navy, Air Force, and the NNSA. So where would the Air Force use this new interoperable? If, 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 if I could. Um, uh, uh, Congressman Garamendi, the, uh, first of all, there is no money in the NNSA account for working on the interoperable. I heard there's some money somewhere. Well, there's not, not explicitly for uh, interoperable on ours. We uh, recall a few years ago we deferred the need date for that till 2030. So our expectations, we've laid it out, is we'll begin the very serious work on that in 2020 because it's about a 10-year process. And the reason uh, why uh, we have been proceeding down the path of having an interoperable is there is an Air Force system that will require a life extension program in about the 2030 timeframe. That's the W-78 uh, warhead. Uh, so there was the, the thinking when this strategy was, was developed was, well, if we're going to uh, do a life extension program to an Air Force system, wouldn't it make sense in terms of long-term cost and efficiency if as you did that particular warhead, you designed it in such a way that it could be used by both the Air Force and the Navy and subsequent uh, uh, interoperable warheads so that you had some commonality uh, beyond uh, back and forth between the, between the two services as you got in the 2030, 2040, 2050 timeframe. And your 50 to 80 new pits your requirement for 50 to 80 new pits, plutonium pits, is it based on this interoperable scheme that is somewhere off there in the future? It is, it is it's based on a number of factors. Uh, one of the factors is the requirements for, uh, you know, the next series of life extension programs, which would include the interoperable warhead. I, we don't have too much yep. time to get yep. into this, but I really want to get into this in great detail because it seems to me that we're about to spend billions of dollars to do something that ultimately isn't going to happen. This interoperable warhead, I, I'm looking over here at the, at the Navy and they're saying not for 30 years, and I haven't had a chance to get to, to General Rand about this, but I'd like to know exactly when his 30-year period is going to begin. And I'm out of time, and we've got votes, and thank you so very, very much. I thank the gentleman. Just in closing, before we uh, recess to, to meet after votes in the SCIF uh, for the closed session, uh, I'll put on the record, General Rand, in 2006, the Air Force identified the UH-1N uh, helicopter as not effective for the IBM security mission. Last year, Secretary James recommended an acquisition strategy that would have so sourced these helicopters, Secretary Carter then shelved that strategy and directed full and open competition. General Wynn, can you commit that you will make it clear to the entire Air Force that anyone who attempts to interfere with the acquisition of this capability will have absolute hell to pay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir.
We're in recess. <laughs>